fact that we expect in terms of jobs from uh, generative AI. Our estimate is that about 40% of jobs globally are vulnerable. To 40%. 40%. Now, vulnerable doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing because some of those jobs you're exposed to AI, but in a positive way, which means it, it increases your productivity. But then the, you could have the other kind of exposure where it actually, you know, you get displaced. So if we do that breakdown, then it's about half and half. Now, there's a lot of variation. So if you look at the US, we have about a 60% exposure. About 30% of that was complementing the worker, and 30% is not complementing the worker. If you look at India, because there's a very large number of workers who are in the agricultural sector, the exposure is lower at around 30%. So in a sense, India doesn't have the negative effect, widespread effect on the labor market, the potential negative effect on the labor market, but it also is then missing out on the positive effect of AI. So that's kind of the broad scope that we have. But usually when it came to say robotics or automation, the impact was on workers who were not very high up the skill pyramid. Now we're seeing a lot of what was previously considered very high end uh, work. I was at a session on Gen AI in the morning at the web center and a lot of say coding now can simply be done through generative artificial intelligence. You've got a young son. How do, how do people who about to hit the working age population, really deal with these changes and prepare to have a meaningful career and a meaningful life going forward. It's certainly the case that this is now replacing, you know, cognitive uh, skills, which is a more ritual kind of more, uh, you know, automatic kind of cognitive work. It is affecting the top end of the spectrum too. Actually, it may be benefiting the less experienced workers because the less experienced workers are able to use Gen AI to kind of build up experience very quickly because of the technology being able to aggregate whatever learning there is that you get from experience. So it benefits you if you have less experience. You're, if you're kind of middling uh, in the management scale, then it has some somewhat, somewhat of a negative effect on you. At the very end, of course, the very, very best are going to benefit from this uh, this technology it complements them the most but right below that you might start seeing a, a negative effect now what we also notice is that those at the very end in terms of skill labor income skill and high incomes also tend to get capital income and here's where the source of inequality can be the biggest because we might see a lot more concentration of wealth at least we're already seeing it in terms of where all the ai is getting developed and produced it's in a few a number of companies and in a couple of countries, it's basically the US and in China. That's where most of the development is happening. So what are you telling your son in terms of preparing for a workforce in the future, of jobs in the future, where a lot of work can be done through generative AI and the rest through robotics and automation? You know, I mean, the first thing, young people have the advantage of being much faster in picking up new technology. Sure. Right. And so what I'm telling him is that he's obviously in college right now. So he's in a good place to learn the AI tools that can raise his productivity. I think the problem, of course, is for the older people who are usually not that savvy about picking up new technology. And there's where the risks would happen. So one of the consequences you asked about the impact on India is, I would say, specifically on call centers. Right? That is the one industry that could very quickly be you know, driven out of business because of AI. And you would not see the kind of outsourcing of work that goes from the US to India through the call center. There is where you might see very quick effects, and, that, and that's one of the areas that I wanted to pay attention and to. As far as countries are concerned, which countries are likely to be the beneficiaries of this, or which are likely to be the biggest losers? Or do you think it's difficult to classify as far as countries are concerned? It's more down to individuals and companies. Right. So we know that countries that have a high level of human capital, great innovation space, good digital infrastructure and the right kinds of regulation are going to benefit from it. So who are these countries? We actually did a, what we call a country preparedness index for AI. Among the top, you have the US, you have Singapore, you have Denmark, you have Germany. India is about the average for emerging markets, kind of in the middle of the pack. But the countries that are going to benefit from it are the ones who are on the up top end in terms of all of these uh, indicators. Let's come to growth. Now, let's start with India. There's a big debate raging at this moment about the kind of uh, economic recovery India is seeing. Government leaning economists say this is not K shaped. A lot of left leaning economists, and I don't want to attribute any ideology to the numbers that different people are doing, but they're insisting that we're seeing a very 
in equal, unequal uh, economic recovery where the rich are becoming richer at the top of the K and the poor are becoming poorer. What's your individual and institutional reading? I mean, at first, I think we should recognize that uh, the Indian economy is doing well. If you look at major economies, it remains one of the fastest growing economies. And, I, and we expect that will be true even in 2024. Two big areas of huge progress have been physical infrastructure, you know, roads, ports, airports, and so on, but also digital infrastructure. I think both of those have been areas of remarkable progress. And that is beneficial to everybody. I mean, it's not just the very rich, it affects all parts of society. We're also seeing consumption growth, you know, to be doing quite well, though we expect it to slow uh, going forward. Yes, the government's public investment push has played a very important role. But again, I think India needs also much more reforms for it to be able to truly realize its potential and make sure that everybody, including youth unemployment, is reduced you know, that, you know, concerns about the case-shaped recovery are addressed. In terms of specific reforms, for instance, financial uh, access to medium, small and micro enterprises, I think is still an area where we, where more work is needed, like credit growth to that particular sector, more is needed on that front. Labor market reforms are needed. Female labor force participation is incredibly low. More needs to be done to, to bring that up. So, I mean, there are many areas of... Reform. So is the recovery shaped or not in your view well it is you, you know it is an economy where there are there is overall growth that is make improving livelihoods for a large number of people but at the same time yes you do see uh that what also typically tends to happen that in these intermediate phases of growth that you see more happening faster at the top end okay so there is in some senses enough data for you to suggest that the recovery is indeed k-shaped i would not no, I would not say that there's enough data for that, because actually, by the way, that is one area where more progress would be very helpful, is to have a lot more data collected at a high enough frequency in India. Uh, if you look at employment numbers and so on, you know, there are still debates on the, on the quality of those numbers. So more data is required. I think the headline story is that India, India's growth is a good one. Uh, it is one of the fastest growing economies of the world. But I would also add that it needs to keep up consistent reforms. So let's come, because you've mentioned reforms twice over. Uh, the Indian government's heading into election mode, so no reform is likely just in the next few weeks and months. But after that, what are the key reforms that you think the Indian state should be undertaking to step up uh, the growth process and to make growth more equitable for all our people? In terms of reforms, this is required not just at the national level, but at the state government level too, because of all these different subjects, of course, are handled at both uh, levels of government. Firstly, continue the good investment that's been done in public infrastructure, including digital public infrastructure. Obviously, that's not done. Much more is needed. Continue that good work. It's shown to bring in a lot more uh, activity, catalyze a lot more activity. Labor market reforms is important. And I said on female labor force participation, that's uh, important. Credit to MSMEs, an important area. Land reforms are also critical. Agricultural sector reforms, these are unfinished But all businesses. these are political hot potatoes. Each time the government tries to touch them, there's a big uh, pushback from the farms or from the street, and that makes it very difficult for any government. That is how it is, but that's what will be needed. Progress on those fronts will be needed to, to kind of get the story to another whole level. When it comes to China, uh, you spoke of the need for more data. I mean, that's... Uh, into two or more in China. What's your reading of just how badly the Chinese economy is doing at this moment? Well, um, firstly, we upgraded China's growth forecast in November. It did better than we were expecting in the second half of this year. Uh, we have growth at 5.4% for China, and we're next year it's about 4.6%. I think the main challenges China faces, one is in the property sector, which is a, an important part of China's economy. It's still in a weak state. And the second is on local government finances and, you know, the financial, uh, the exposures local government financing vehicles have, right? So that's another area. I think those two are going to be critical to address if you, re if, you know, you, can, you want to get consumer sentiment back into the positive territory. The government is moving on these fronts. They have put some more stimulus in place. And that's why we, one of the reasons why we upgraded. But it is true that if you look outwards and we look into our medium term forecast, we have growth at Five is out at about three and a half percent for for China. 
So it is projected to come down. In addition to the two factors I mentioned, it's of course the aging demographics and weak productivity growth in China. But there are reforms, again, in the case of China, there are reforms that can absolutely change that story. And more market-based uh, reforms would be very helpful. In your economic models, is it now seeming almost certain that there is no scenario where China could overtake the United States at some point in time in the future? Well, it, it depends upon how you measure the, uh, you know, whether you use, use PPP-based statistics or market exchange rate-based statistics. So, you know, we are not really paying that close attention to who's overtaking who at this point. In terms of per capita income, of course, China still has a long way to go to get to the levels of uh, uh, the U.S. And that's where they should be focused on. Which are the countries which are of the maximum concern to you when you look at the world, especially in India's neighborhood? What concerns you the most, Dr. Gopina? No, I think if you're, uh, for low-income countries, I'm going to step back out of the, in, uh, the neighborhood of India, but low-income countries have been struggling for the past three to four years. Their debt levels are either already in distress levels or they are doing debt restructuring. And while emerging markets, otherwise in major emerging market economies like India, have actually done fine these past three, four years, despite interest rates going up so much in the U.S., Low-income countries have been shut out of these markets. So that's a part of the world that we're paying uh, close attention to and you know, where the risks are quite high. In India's neighborhood, Pakistan, Sri Lanka have been massive areas of concern. So we have programs both with uh, Sri Lanka and with Pakistan. In the, case of, in the case of Sri Lanka, we just had a review and you know, there are, there's lots of good news coming out of there. Inflation has come down quite a lot. We're seeing the recovery. We expect growth to come back up positive signs over there. Pakistan, actually, the caretaker government also, we believe, have done, has done a good job in terms of stabilizing the economy, but they have, have was elections coming up. So we'll see once the next government comes. You know, what and before we like. wrap up, since we're running out of time, uh, I was seeing that the IMF's estimate for India's growth for this fiscal is 6.3. The RBI's own initial estimates seem to suggest 7.4. So what is it that you're picking up, which is 1% different from what the RBI and the government's own estimate seems to be? So firstly, we are putting out our January update uh, towards the end of this month. So you'll be revising it upwards? Month, and we are in the process of revising up. For, uh, Does for it India. catch up to 7.4 or not really? That you will have to wait and see. I think it had a good, very strong first half of fiscal year 23 24. For the second half, we are seeing more slowing. I mean, that's not unexpected given that there was much more front loading of public investment. And we're also seeing some softening in, cons in consumer spending. But we will be revising up and we will see the numbers. Okay, it's uh, been interesting talking to you. It's also good that you've right at the end given the sense that there will be an upward revision in the IMF's growth prospects. So you'll come closer towards uh, 7.4 or wherever your numbers ultimately land up. We wish you all the best. I hope you have a great week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rahul, and I hope you enjoy Davos. It's been really nice. Thank you. What about you? Have you been out and about? The sun is up. It's looking lovely. Have you just been, uh, your mind is just taking you from one meeting to the next? I'm, I unfortunately have a packed schedule. So no, but I'm, I'm like, I like seeing this. You have a nice background. Yeah, yeah you should go out. The sun is up <laughs> and it's lovely. It's the best time to be out. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. most consequential things that will happen this year is the presidential elections in the United States and no matter who wins and how things shape from January to November, the ultimate victor on the 5th of November will have a very big role in shaping how the world order moves from here. Could it be the erratic Donald Trump? Could it be Joe Biden once again, despite his age and health? To talk about some of the factors at play in the United States, in India and globally, we're joined here at the India Today Business Today studios at the World Economic Forum at Davos by Samir Saran, one of India's leading think tankers, president of the Observer Research Foundation. With us also is Ravi Agarwal, editor-in-chief of one of the world's most respected foreign policy journals, Foreign Policy. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. I want to start by asking you, Ravi, from your perch, given uh, how the American presidential elections are shaping up, are you now veering around to the inevitability of a Joe Biden versus Trump presidential contest in November? Yeah, absolutely. It's as close to inevitable as it gets. It would take uh, a dramatic turnaround uh, in the courts. 
for Trump to not be the candidate. Uh, Joe Biden obviously is the candidate. Uh, it's unlikely that anyone will challenge him at this stage. So given that we're looking at Biden-Trump 2.0, I think it's time now for the world to try and understand what either side means for them, whether it's India, whether it's Europe. And there are a lot of big ticket issues, I think, that are on the table from a global sense. Um, Americans, of course, will vote on largely pocketbook issues. And remember, again, many Americans, given how polarized America is, they already have a strong sense of which way they want to go. So a lot depends on turnout. But if you're in the rest of the world, you're going to worry about the future of multilateralism. You're going to worry about how America engages with the world. If you're in Europe, you're going to worry about America's support for Ukraine. Uh, you're going to worry about how America might treat China, whether there will be a change, whether Trump 2.0 will be unleashed in a different way. Um, so those are all concerns, I think, that the rest of the world is going to be thinking about very deeply. Candidate Trump so far has seemed more calibrated and balanced than the mercurial Trump we saw first time around. Is that just a facade or could this be the new Trump? Because his advisors seem to suggest that he's a changed man. Is that even possible? I'm not so sure that I would say he's calibrated. Uh, he has said on the campaign trail that he will go after people who uh, didn't support him or weren't loyal to him. He said all kinds of things that, you know, would worry any supporters of democracy in the United States, uh, any supporters of uh, the rule of law. Um, I think it's immensely worrying. It's not just whether you're red or blue, Republican or Democrat. Um, a return of Trump would prove to Americans and the world uh, that his four years weren't a blip, that the chaos uh, and the sense of vengeance is very real. I think he has been very clear that he would go after a lot of people, um, that a second term would be the term where he now knows exactly what to do. Um, he would be unleashed in a sense. There's a lot to worry there. So, I mean, what could President Trump mean for India and for the world, in your view, if it does come down to that? Rahul, I think first, before I respond to that particular question and try to warm myself up in this freezing <laughs> temperature, let me just, uh, you know, uh, observe something from what uh, Ravi just mentioned. In any other part of the world, if you had the developments that you've seen in America in the last six to eight months, cases being filed against the opposition candidate, the opposition candidate making outrageous statements and literally abusing everyone and, 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 and every region of the world at some point, you, know, you would have said this is a nutcase democracy, this is a sham, this is not democracy, right? Uh, uh, can you imagine in any other part of the world an opposition candidate having 20 cases filed against him in, in the year when you're campaigning and America saying, oh no, fine, it's... And so calling I, for insurrection. And, 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 and calling for insurrection. You know, look, it, 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 it's, it's a spectacle rather than a democratic process right now in the US. And uh, none of us should be, um, uh, it, you know, taking this lightly. I think uh, it, it, it forebodes a number of issues. Uh, the most important is the durability of America to remain a viable and influential actor in the world affairs in the future. I think that's the first big thing we all have to realize that a world without a rational, strong, sensible, influential America is upon us and we have to start looking at plan Bs. All of us have to start thinking about it. So I think what this election tells us is that we need plan B and, and I think that is my response to you. Now my response to you is that there are three sets of countries, many more, but three sets of countries in terms of how they are assessing the elections as, as, as we go forward. First, many who rely on America for security, for their economics, for their relevance, are worried. And they should be. Uh, uh, the, you know, as governments change and as governments change in a dramatic way with very differing worldviews, they are likely to be most affected. Many of them depend on America for many of these important national um, consideration, security, economics, um, and of course, the voice and agency they have in international platforms. Now, there are a second set of countries who actually are enjoying this. They are actually seeing this as a way of, of, of claiming the space that uh, America, in is, is America is inadvertently um, vacating. So there are many who see this moment as a moment to actually claim those spaces, make themselves more heard, make themselves more um, integrated into uh, uh, communities that would have otherwise preferred to be somewhere else. So and that's the second set of nations. The third, uh, and I think those are possibly countries such as India, who, will, who are carving out new arrangements, who are building resilient mechanisms uh, to manage the ebbs and flows of uh, American politics. 
So you see a concerted effort by many of the emerging powers to actually not take sides or, or root for one particular outcome, but rather build your own capacities and capabilities and partnerships and friendships and, and alignments so that you can, uh, in many ways, ride the storm. Now, India is perhaps one amongst a handful, and I'm being a little optimistic here, is amongst those rare countries who are impervious to regime change in America, if I could, if I could use that word that Americans use for third world countries in the last century. So when a regime change happens in America, we would, ra we would largely be impervious because it is a broad-based relationship where you have a multi both parties agree on at least the core of the relationship. Uh, of course, the progressives have their own agendas and the, and, and, and the mercantilists have their own uh, grouse with India. Both of them have some bits of grouses. But largely, the trunk of the relationship has remained unchanged and has only grown and become stronger in the last 20 years across presidents, across prime ministers on both sides, right? And I think um, India would uh, have to continue to focus on building the institutions that will drive the relationship forward and not necessarily worry about the politics that is going to be uh, defining uh, the sound vibes. Uh, we have to work with the intelligence folks, the military folks, the, the business folks. We have to work with the regulators. We have to work with the green transitions folks. We have to navigate the IRA and its implications on us. We have to work with them on creating global governance for uh, technology and, 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 and AI and all other uh, disruptive um, uh, uh, you know, innovations that are happening. So I think our relationship is now far more nuanced and deeper than uh, an election. Ravi, in a very tight election, what do you think will ultimately decide whether Biden prevails or Trump? Turnout, for one. Um, even in Iowa this past uh, week, we saw extreme cold temperatures leading to a decline in turnout, which could have affected some of the other candidates. Not Trump, clearly, because a lot of his supporters uh, are very motivated and you know care a lot about getting out and supporting him. Um, but I think turnout will matter a lot. And remember, the American election process is very strange. You've got basically around 50,000 people in four odd states that, yes, that are going to end up deciding this election. And so a lot will hinge on you know, how they see uh, the contrast between Trump and Biden in the weeks leading up to the election. For example, over the last few weeks, a lot of Democratic strategists have been very worried about polls suggesting that Arab Americans uh, are unhappy with Biden because of the way in which America has handled uh, the conflict in the Middle East. Now, for example, if you're in Dearborn, Michigan, which is a, a battleground state, um, that is going to affect Biden. The question is, one year from now, in this case, 10 months from now, um, are voters going to remember that? Are they going to focus on Gaza if you're Muslim American? Or are they going to focus on the fact that the other guy, Trump, is a president who tried to enact a so-called Muslim ban? So the stakes, I think both sides will be trying to make very clear the contrast between uh, the candidates. And I think a lot will depend on the mood in the moment. For example, with the economy, uh, Experts now are quite sure that the economy is actually doing much better than people believe it is doing. And part of this is because economic indicators are a lagging indicator. But ultimately, you can't tell people what to feel. If people feel that inflation is biting them, you can't tell them otherwise. A lot will depend in the next few months whether uh, wage inflation catches up with real inflation, whether people begin to believe that actually they are doing better than they were. Part of the problem here as well is this is not just about economics, it's about behavioral science. For example, if you uh, get a 10% raise, but inflation is 9%, um, you believe that you deserved the 10% and you did not deserve the 9% inflation. Mm -hmm. So you're still going to complain about the price of bread and eggs being higher than they are because you like to complain about it. So Biden's going to have to battle all of those factors, uh, incumbency, um, and of course his age, concerns about that, although Trump is not that much younger. So, so what are you making of the fact that young Americans in the recent data seem to be suggesting that they, that they like Trump? It is worrying. Uh, it is worrying. Uh, and part of this, again, remember, for the last eight odd years, all of us have 
kind of bored ourselves to death trying to examine and uh, think backwards about why people voted for Trump. And we've gone through a cycle of various theories. The theories include that some Americans felt left behind. Mm -hmm. Some theories are about white supremacy. Some are about uh, anti-globalization. Some are about, uh, you know, anti-cosmopolitanism. Uh, who knows what the exact reason is? But there is something. It's something in America is broken in that there's a, a rising sense of distrust um, about so-called uh, seemingly smug kind of Clinton era strategists in DC. Um, there's a lot of disillusionment about the way in which government works. And there's a lot of polarization, which comes in part from the way the media is set up in America. All of these forces are going to collide. I'll add one more, mis- and disinformation. Mm -hmm. All of us are extremely worried about how that might play out in this election. Mm -hmm. Uh, it played out in the last two elections. Uh, you'll remember that there were fears that the Russians had tried to interfere in 2020 and before that. This time it's going to be worse. And here at Davos, a lot of us are talking about AI and how that might play a role in mis- and disinformation. And Americans are extremely vulnerable to that, given the way in which the media ecosystem works there. So there are a lot of worries. There are a lot of concerns. Uh, we'll have to see how it plays out. But again, an extremely small number of people hold the fate of America and maybe even the world at some level, or at least multilateralism. Trump, well, let, 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 me, let me just uh, qualify that. A small number of people all on TikTok hold the future of America in their hands. It's amazing. They have a country so sophisticated in its uh, technology, uh, you know, technology prowess, America. You know, it's, it's the fountainhead of innovation. It's so meek and it's so naive in, in tech regulation that they're still debating whether TikTok is something that is, is is good for America or bad for America. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just, that's an aside. Yeah. But I think... No, but when uh, Trump won the first time, mm -hmm. the sense outside was, okay, uh, maybe post uh, Barack Obama, a lot of Americans started feeling that he got left behind and this is the pushback of middle America. What does it mean about America, in your view, if Trump were to win again, or at least, you know, be on the ticket and make it a real look, election? Look, I think Trump is an unusual candidate. He was the first American president who defeated two parties to win the presidency. <laughs> Everyone normally fights from a party. He defeated the Republicans first, then he defeated the Democrats, and then he became president. So Trump is a, a, a cult by himself. And we have, to, we have to understand that. That in a presidential form of government, we were always worried that we, would, we might have a runaway individual. And Trump is precisely that. So I think Trump represents a, a break from America's uh, rather stable uh, recent history of more than 100 years, uh, where you have not vis witnessed a runaway train, uh, such as uh, 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 what Donald Trump represents. Now, what does he fight on? He fights on exactly the same um, uh, uh, vulnerabilities and anxieties of people uh, that folks around the world fight on. Now, what is that? It is not how you are doing. It is how someone else is doing and are you doing worse off? And I think he fights on, he fights on, uh, 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 one, uh, the comparative inequality in society and not the overall lifting up of the economic situation of individuals, right? So, uh, and he uses technology and digital media and, and of course, uh, imagery and, and, and typologies of the past uh, to reinforce the point. Migrant is the problem if you're not doing well. You know, migration is the problem if you're not doing well. Communities, certain specific communities are the reason why uh, you are in the state you are in. He is, he is using a 20th century playbook in 21st century grammar, vocabulary and technology. There is nothing new about his campaign. What has changed is exactly what Ravi mentioned. The public sphere in America had ignored the half of America for the longest time. You know, when things were going well, at, at the peak of Pax Americana, it was basically 25% of American elites who represented the Pax Americana. 75% were excluded from the press, were excluded from um, financial institutions, were excluded from economic mainstream programs. They were generally growing at a different speed, living in a different reality, uh, uh, and facing uh, daily situations which were remarkably, dif remarkably different to those in the coasts, uh, West Coast and East Coast. America had a problem. 
America had a serious problem. It had a structural problem which has created a constituency that does that believes that it has no relationship whatsoever with uh, the, what the Democratic Party today represents. Right? Uh, guess what? The, in, in the most recent times, and this is the point Ravi was making, in the most recent times, there's a breach in the Democratic Party itself. Now, in the, uh, you have the centrist of old, the Clintonians and and perhaps I would argue even the Biden uh, uh, format of governance, what he has shown in his first term, who are more centre-left and, and who look at uh, uh, American uh, force for the world being a force for good, uh, who, uh, into, who are internationalists by definition, who seek to do uh, good as they assess it. I'm not saying they always end up doing it, but as they assess it. But they are generally folks who are what we would call the centre, the centrists, right? Now, there, there's a breach in the Democratic Party. There are progressives who are sometimes as ridiculous as uh, uh, the Trumpians. You know, the, the, the extreme left of the, uh, of the Democratic Party and the, and the right uh, in American politics are, are, are both seemingly, um, you know, uh, uh, unrelatable to people who are sitting in different parts of the world, right? And those folks are perhaps the weakest link in Biden's re-election bid. Will they go out and vote for him? Because for him, uh, uh, Ukraine, for them, Ukraine was, uh, was, was peak American uh, internationalism and, uh, and uh, intervening for Israel and against Hamas is, is a failure of America. The same group, the same chunk which was celebrating a, a, a intervention in Ukraine is the one that is bemoaning American intervention in the Middle East. How do they behave will decide what, because see, please understand, Trump starts with a 2% disadvantage. That is the way America is structured. Republicans don't have the numbers. If, if, if all Democrat folks come out and vote, it is very difficult to, de to defeat the Democrats. The question is, will they come out and vote for Biden after breach of trust, as they see, uh, has happened in the Middle East? In an election year, it's very difficult for any president to take big foreign policy decisions. Given that reality, Ravi, how do you see the situation in the Middle East play out from here? America is putting some pressure, not adequate in the view of India and many other countries, on uh, Israel to now start pulling back on the hostilities in Gaza. Not that that's making any difference to Benjamin Netanyahu. There is the concern about a potential escalation with the, the Hezbollah and the Houthis who continue to uh, keep attacking uh, shipping liners. So how do you see the situation play out from here? I'm worried. I'm very concerned about how America is handling the crisis in the Middle East. You mentioned the Houthis. Uh, this week, uh, America and UK forces have tried mm -hmm. to bomb uh, Houthi positions. The Houthis are defined. They will escalate at some point, and they already have uh, in attacking a US ship this week. Um, remember, part of the reason behind all of this is to free up the Red Sea to, to allow commercial vessels to go through, which has impacts on supply chains and insurance around the world. That hasn't changed. So there's still a lot of fear about a wider war. You mentioned Hezbollah. They haven't even entered the fray in a big way. If they do, this war becomes so much bigger and America gets mired in in a much more serious way. That is immensely concerning. I think, you know, on October 8, the day after um, Hamas's horrific attack on Israel, President Biden did the right thing. He decided to go to Israel. He decided to stand with Israel. Um, but I think in the days since, um, as destruction in Gaza has continued, as the death toll has mounted, as we've learned more about what's happening there, and also the fact that Hamas is still operating, it's uh, it, the, the notion that one could destroy this group, as Israel has claimed it wants to do, um, is, is, is a claim that, you know, uh, beggar's belief at this point. Um, and so I think how quickly America can pivot, can add pressure on Israel, can force Israel to think about an end game, that's going to be very important. And I think America maybe has miscalculated a little bit how much it is losing support in the Middle East, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, even among countries that are not part of any of those constituencies, India, for example. There's the a divergence. South the global south generally. There's also a divergence between America and Europe mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to how to act with Israel. So Biden has to step up. I mean, the thing is, he has all this leverage on Israel. The question is, when do you lose use that leverage? Prime Minister Modi and Benjamin Netanyahu are very close. And now suddenly Netanyahu is persona non grata. Uh, in Israel, people want him gone as soon as possible. And India has had a long-standing relationship with the people of Palestine and for the Palestinian cause. That puts a country like India in a very tricky situation. 
given uh, what's playing out now and the fact that our uh, shipping vessels also are being attacked with the Houthis. So, Rahul, any country that has good ties and feels well for both sets of people, uh, both sides of the conflict, Palestinian people, not the Hamas, let's make a distinction between Hamas and the Palestinian people and I think that is important. Uh, uh, every time we say Hamas, we tend to invisibilize uh, the Palestinians uh, who are actually uh, the ones who are perhaps bearing the brunt of uh, uh, this conflict uh, and the Israeli people. And I think any country who feels well for both of these sets of people, the Palestinians and Israel, like India has uh, always done, uh, is going to be in a, in a sticky place. Because, uh, you know, in some ways, if you were an evil planner in the Hamas wing of disruption and, and, and devastation, this is precisely the kind of response you would have hoped for and the kind of uh, uh, the uh, media imagery and, and the narrations that have emerged in the last uh, few months, you would have actually wanted this kind of a global public outcry to bring this conflict center stage to make it alive again. Remember, no one was talking about it. People were talking about uh, a new Middle East. People were talking about connectivity. People were talking about the Abraham Accords. There were many who did not want this to happen. And if you were if you were a planner and you wanted to disrupt all of this, this is exactly what you had wanted. So I think Hamas, in many ways, have succeeded in doing what they set out to do by 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 a bringing this whole uh, uh, old and historic dispute back at the heart of global discussions today. And I think that's an important element. But more importantly, um, they have also in many ways been able to galvanize the traditional non-aligned communities of the past of the 20th century into um, uh, mobilizing against uh, uh, the Israeli nation, not against Netanyahu, against the Israeli nation, uh, you know, South Africa in, 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 the, in the courts, for example, right? So in many ways, they've also been able to tap into the 20th century collectives uh, uh, to come up and speak against Israel. Uh, and I think both of them hide uh, or rather are inadequate to uh, to come to, uh, in some ways, an understanding of what is really uh, happening. Yes, Netanyahu, in uh, by all accounts, uh, is, is no longer the Netanyahu of many years ago. He has progressively chosen to stay relevant by changing his politics over time. It is, it is his part of his political continuance. And, and I don't think India's relationship with Israel is about Netanyahu. India's relationship with Israel <laughs> existed far before. Netanyahu was, uh, 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 the project Netanyahu was even conceived, right? So the idea that we have, uh, that, that India has a relationship uh, which is somehow joined up with Netanyahu is, is wrong. We have a relationship with Israel which is independent of Netanyahu and we have a position on Palestine that is time immemorial. In some ways, we always stood for it. And India is, is, is trying to make both of them happen uh, against terror and for the Palestinian people. And we have to do both of it. Let's spend a moment on the Russia-Ukraine conflict. President Vladimir Zelensky is at the World Economic Forum Congress Center at the moment. In fact, as I was coming up, I just bumped into him as he was walking in for his session. And the narrative at Davos seems to have changed on Ukraine. Uh, last year, the question was, could there be a palace coup against uh, Putin? Previously, the question was, how long will the war go on for? At one point in time, there was a question, can Putin and Russia lose? Now the question is, can uh, Putin actually win? What's your sense? Look, I think more than win or lose, um, this has been uh, a conflict that, you know, seems like it's going to go on for a while. Um, and I think you have to think of it in terms of what changes the status quo. And at what point will the Ukrainians want to try um, and push for a settlement of no, sorts? Maybe Putin doesn't want it. Well, Putin actually privately has signaled that he would be willing uh, to seek a settlement of sorts. But wasn't that earlier when we didn't know uh, as much as we do now and the fact that maybe Trump wins in the US and Putin says, hey, I just need to hold on to November and after that I can knock these guys out? Yeah, that could well be the case. Uh, Putin is betting on Trump winning for sure. Um, Ukraine is betting on uh, Biden winning. Uh, absolutely. So the stakes are clear there. Um, I think both sides also will want to try and push for a settlement at a time when they are in the ascendancy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the timing is going to be very important for both sides. Um, Ukraine has several milestones to look forward to this year. I mean, 
the spring and then summer and then winter counteroffensive didn't work out. It doesn't seem like they have the ammunition to push again for a counteroffensive until maybe 2025. So on Ukraine's uh, uh, point of view, this is going to be, you know, mostly a defensive kind of uh, maneuvering throughout 2024. Um, but however, on the diplomatic front, um, they are trying to reorient some of their military supply chains through Europe rather than just depending on America. So they're very concerned about Trump, but they're also planning for a world in which Trump is president. Um, look out for the uh, 75th anniversary of NATO, uh, the big summit in June where Ukraine is going to hopefully push for assurances and get them um, that it will eventually join NATO in two or three years. And those are all things that could lead to a pathway towards a settlement. And the reason why I say that is if NATO were to agree to create a pathway for Ukraine to join, then it would agree to defend the parts of Ukraine that Ukraine currently controls. So about 80% of the country, which would then mean that NATO has to defend those 80% uh, sort of parts of territory that Ukraine does control. That'll be big. If that happens, we might have the beginnings of a settlement in 2024 that will likely take longer to work out, 25 or 26. But this is, this is a war that will continue for a while. What's your reading? How is this conflict likely to play out from here? And what does it mean for India? Look, for us, I think we have to continue to be among those few voices which encourage early resolution or an off-ramp at least, even as we work on the resolution. So I think there are two parts to it. First, there has to be a working ceasefire. It could still be, uh, 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 it could still involve military buildups on both sides. But let's try and get the fighting to stop. I think that's the first thing we need to look at. And then let's try to carve out something that is workable. Uh, if uh, what Ravi was to say was to bear out, in some sense, 80% uh, of Ukraine, part of NATO, 20% as what I would call uh, the, the safe zone between Russia and NATO, because that's what Russia's uh, political uh, anxiety is, to have NATO on its border, right? So uh, Ukraine joining NATO was something that had terrified them. It's not going to change now. If they fought for it earlier, they were decided. if they decided to uh, step into Ukraine to fix that earlier, that is not going to go away. And uh, uh, Putin is standing for his own elections. He's probably regained his popularity. He's more popular today than he was two years ago. I, I think most folks would uh, uh, agree to that. And there's uh, no real way of knowing that. I mean, how do you know? There's he, no real polling in uh, Russia about popularity. Look, look I think, the I, I, think I, what they think I think Rahul sitting in Davos, the wind has affected you. Russia has the largest turnout of, uh, of uh, during its elections. And uh, uh, they do see voting. Now, uh, we could always... I mean, we it could helps always, if you jail all of your opponents. Look, look, look. <laughs> I think you have to be fair here. They have large turnouts. And a large chunk of that turnouts votes in favor of Putin. I think that's a fact. Everything else is conjecture. I'm just telling you that. But it's also true that many American surveys that had polled... Uh, on the point that had asked the question about Russia's popularity two years ago versus more recently will tell you that's been a marked upswing in support he has. So I think his worst phase in this battle is behind him. He is far more uh, a confident of uh, a new plan that had emerged post the early setbacks that and by the way they were not just early they were a long sustained setbacks for nearly one year. It was a tough one year for uh, uh, for Russia. Um, for a war that they considered to be over in 15 minutes so they wanted it over in 15 days uh, was was lasting many many months sorry i said years i meant 15 days uh, now it was a long one year for them it was a long winter for him i think th th those days are behind them uh, i am not sure that he is waiting for um, trump's election i am sure his plan is is immune to american politics uh, great powers make their own and they certainly consider themselves as one and, and and they make their own uh, 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 assessments. I, I, I think Ravi is absolutely right. He would like a ceasefire when he believes he can negotiate a better outcome. Uh, uh, and the NATO would want a ceasefire when they can negotiate a better outcome. Uh, Ukraine is not a player in this. Ukraine is the proxy used by a $40 trillion and a multi-country coalition that is negotiating the terms of Europe's future. The, it is now no longer about the conflict that started two and a half years ago. It's 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 a resolution. It's about is about the clutch of EU twenty seven plus America and a few others. It's about the thirty odd countries sitting on one side with a forty trillion dollar GDP and a two trillion dollar GDP sitting on the other side negotiating the terms of of resolution of Europe. 
So I don't think this battle is about, I think uh, invoking Ukraine is, is, is not necessarily correct. It is, a, it is a Western Europe, America discussion with Russia on the future of Europe. And both sides would like to do this discussion on terms that benefit them. Um, yes, uh, Russia may believe that uh, uh, waiting a few months, holding out a few more days might uh, allow them to negotiate better terms. But uh, I suspect uh, both America and Russia are in conversations already. I don't suspect. I know they are. And, and they are talking to each other at various levels. And uh, I don't think the Europeans are very excited about that. But I do know that at least the American security, intelligence and, 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 and thinking community has been discussing the, the possible off-ramps, uh, has also been throwing trial balloons through media and other uh, discussion forums, ha is also reaching out to think tankers in Russia or academics in Russia to have the conversation. Work. There is an effort. I'm not sure uh, in an election year, the Americans can go beyond, they can go the whole way in pushing this towards a certain direction. And I don't think uh, uh, Russia is is harmed by waiting for it to get over, the election to get over. It might result in an outcome that might be more favorable to them. So I think both of them cannot accelerate this before the elections in some sense. Uh, and one party gains either way. Sure, this has been a fascinating conversation. Lots of sharp insights there. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.